conversation that we're having today. In my own work, uh, I focus on uh, workplace transformation and change, uh, really exploring what is uh, the experience of work, whether that is in um, offices as it has been traditionally, uh, or in our homes that is, as it is now, uh, or in virtual places uh, connected around the world that it might be in the future. Um, and uh, I will hope to moderate uh, today's panel in a way that uh, brings new insights and perspectives to the work that you're doing uh, in, the, in the audience. Um, but please do participate, uh, jump in that chat. Uh, if you've got a minute now, you might um, put in the chat uh, where, you, where you are right now. Um, is that a geography? Is that a state of mind? Uh, anything uh, that might help us get to know our audience a little bit. Um, and actually with that in mind, we're going to start with an audience poll. Um, I think that you all know that the world has changed uh, possibly pretty radically uh, as a result uh, of COVID. And one of the biggest changes has been um, where we're working. Uh, so Katie, if you wouldn't mind bringing up that first audience poll and we can hear what some of the uh, perspective of our audience is. So question one, how many days per week did you spend working remotely outside of the office prior to COVID-19 restrictions? Um, and if you'd give us an answer to that question. And uh, sorry, panelists, you're not allowed to vote here. We'll just get to uh, sit on the edge of our seat and uh, wait till we get the results from the audience. Um, and then question number two, how many days per week would you like to or plan to work remotely uh, in the future? So really we're, we're looking to understand the change. What was life like, uh, what was work life uh, like for you in the past from a location perspective? And what are you planning in the future? Um, again, imagining that long-term future uh, sort of post COVID if, uh, if there could be such a thing. Um, so just give uh, people a minute to answer that. And then, uh, Caitlin, I think you can probably see a percent response. Uh, looks like we've got 50 participants here today. Um, so close that when you can. And we have a message that says chat is disabled by the host. So Caitlin, when you get a chance to turn that on, please do. All right, uh, so folks said, wow, 60% of folks said they didn't work outside of the office any days per week. Um, but we then at the other end of the spectrum had a, a five day a week cohort that were fully outside of the office uh, pre COVID. That's, uh, that's an interesting disposition there. And um, then here on post COVID, uh, the majority 30% looking for three days a week outside of the office. Um, and the greatest change uh, is in that zero days per week. And I think that this is really what we could all say um, is a big trend, is that uh, the world uh, changed or we can't unsee what has happened um, in, in regard to teleworking uh, and flexible working. That um, even if we um, do go back to, uh, uh, go back to uh, a, a traditional office model, it's not gonna be like the traditional office model we would have experienced in the past. Um, those answers are a, a little bit um, uh, on the edge, uh, but really the same story we've heard in asking this question uh, around the world, uh, which is that the people who um, did the least amount of time outside of the office in the past um, are now a really uh, important uh, cohort in promoting, promoting that going forward. Okay, so I hope that sets the stage for what we're all doing here today um, and, uh, and gets our audience engaged. I would next like to turn to our fabulous panel um, where we have uh, four uh, diverse uh, experts uh, in this industry, all of us thinking about um, looking at this precipice of change and trying to make sense of it. Um, and um, as, uh, as one of the panelists, Nathan, uh, said to me yesterday, uh, none of us are experts in this. Um, we're, we're maybe uh, thoughtful about change and creative, um, but this is new for all of us. Um, and I thought that was such a, a great way of positioning the conversation. So we'll be giving you our thoughtfulness, our perspective, um, but none of, none of us really uh, knows or, or has the, a crystal ball. Um, so I'd like to start with uh, Andre. Um, Andre, if you could uh, introduce yourself and um, we'd like to hear a little bit um, about your perspective on this topic of change. 
Uh, thanks, Melissa. Um, so my name is Andre Soleri. I am an architect and the principal of Soleri Architecture, and we're a small practice in Manhattan. Uh, we founded about 15 years ago, and we do a pretty wide range of work. Um, I'm primarily here today, I believe, because of the work that I've been doing as a member of the Unified COVID-19 Task Force at the New York chapter of the AIA, where I formed a working group that is um, currently producing webinars specifically for small businesses and trying to help them reopen by distilling the many guidelines that are out there into a series of case studies that show how to sort of quickly practice practically and sort of flexibly comply with these guidelines, regardless of a company's size, budget, or resources. Um, and we've been working on these webinars since July, and uh, we've had to revise them many times. And most of my comments this morning will be based on the work that we've been doing um, as a team and trying to, to tackle uh, sort of the challenges of how, of how to reopen uh, offices and small business during this pandemic. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, and next we are going to Dennis. Could we hear a little bit about your perspective uh, on this topic of change and the research you've been doing? Uh oh, we can't hear you. Come off mute. Nope, you're muted. So sorry. <laughs> All good. Okay, anyway, I'm Dennis Redlick and I'm from uh, founding principal of uh, Barlow Redlick Architects. Um, I am a New Yorker living and working remotely in the Hudson Valley. Uh, I'm joining this conversation on behalf of the AI New York uh, uh, located at the Center for Architecture in New York City. Um, I'm co-chair of one of the 27 uh, knowledge communities and uh, my knowledge community focuses on residential design and that's uh, the design of private homes, um, uh, you know, uh, Homes on individual lots, townhomes, condominiums, lofts. And uh, in preparation for my discussion today, I reached out to uh, AI members and uh, to colleagues who are designing homes in the Midwest and also on the West Coast. Excellent. Thank you, Dennis. We'll be on the edge of our seats uh, looking forward to some of those unique trends that you see evolving. Um, and next we have uh, Nathan McRae. Hi, uh, so Nathan McCray, I'm a director with Snowheda. Um, we do primarily cultural institutional work. Um, I've done libraries and we do performing arts centers and, and landscapes. Um, I, I think the, the, the way that I ended up here is uh, we got an unusual project for us a couple of few, three years ago now, um, which was a master plan for Ford Motor Company, um, which we completed about a year ago. And we're now starting the the first building, um, we're, we're just wrapping up schematic design with the first large building there. It's about 2 million square feet uh, research and engineering center. Uh, and it's about half a uh, workplace. So um, as we started schematic design on that project, uh, COVID happened. So we all had to transition to learning from learning how to work remotely ourselves. Um, and also while experiencing that, uh, had to start thinking about the impacts that it would have on the project that we were in the middle of working on. So we, we have recently formed what we call the COVID task force, which was um, uh, twofold. It, it had two components. One was really dug into programming and policy and kind of uh, cultural issues within that company uh, that, that would be transformed through uh, as, a, as an outcome of, of, of everything that's changing. Um, the other was more physical and inf infrastructural, maybe more technical, um, which is something that I got kind of deeply into um, where the outcomes were more spatial strategies and, and evaluating technical strategies and grouping them together in order to provide a kind of suite of solutions to, uh, to recommend to the client to be implemented in the project as things are already being procured like elevators. So it's been a very fast um, kind of nimble process and we were just arriving at the outcomes. So um, lots of interesting kind of thoughts there. Excellent. Thank you, Nathan. In, in architecture and design work, especially on a large project, things are always likely to change over the course of the project. This one probably uh, more than average. Thank you. Um, 
And then Katie, uh, you're doing some interesting uh, kind of shifting from the sustainability and energy uh, side of uh, building uh, engineering and technology uh, into health and wellness. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and what you're getting up to at the moment? Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Coppola. I am with JLL's energy and sustainability team out of New York. I am back in the office now. We are doing every other week, 50% capacity. Um, been doing it since September. Um, so kind of taking that first step back into the office. And so I work with um, commercial owners and tenants to develop their ESG um, and sustainability strategy and, and implement that across the portfolio. Uh, in recent months, we've definitely been working with um, our clients to prepare for re-entry to the workplace, um, to understand how we can integrate health and wellness strategies um, while still um, achieving those energy efficiency, water efficiency goals that um, have been a priority in um, recent years. And so we've really been using um, some of these third party rating systems, well health and safety, fitwell um, viral response module um, as the guides, as well as looking to um, ASPRAE's recommendations and standards to ensure that this is a comprehensive, uh, effective and flexible COVID response that fosters long-term health and wellness uh, within the workplace. I've been working on these brand, uh, the brand new I think the Well Health and Safety came out in about June and FitWell came about in um, August for their FitWell viral response specifically. And so working with a lot of, I'm sure, the architects and engineers that have kind of been um, approaching this as some of our clients that are doing um, new build outs or are trying to retrofit right now, understanding what are those design features that need to be a part of our design moving forward to support the operational um, policies and procedures that are really ensuring that we're mitigating the spread of germs and ensuring that occupants are um, comfortable when they're coming back to the workplace and confident um, in their safety, health and wellness being a priority moving forward. Excellent. Thank you, Katie. Um, and that's almost a, a perfect setup for Andre because I think we're going to come back to this point of guidelines and what is changing and how do you stay up to date. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, Andre, if you might tell us a little bit more about some of those things that you're getting up to in terms of supporting um, the built world and the, the knowledge community uh, on this topic, and, and maybe also a little bit about where you see the importance of flexibility uh, in our future. Sure. Um, so one of the key challenges that, uh, that my small business webinar team encountered is that the guidelines essentially seem to be in a circular reference loop. And they are appear to be built on a fairly vague foundation of pretty limited information. And then they start to cross-reference each other. Um, and a great example of this is essentially the bedrock of social distancing in all of these guidelines. It's the six foot rule. So it's referenced in every guideline, but none of them actually really explain it. And this might sound crazy, but my team spent about two weeks trying to pin down exactly where do you measure from and how does it work? Because many of the drawings and diagrams that are out there right now, they show a six foot circle. But the problem is that most of them are drawn from the center line of a person so that the actual distance between two people is less than six feet. And to make matters worse, a lot of those circles actually only use a three foot radius which is misleading because while it produces a six foot circle, it doesn't actually show the distance between them. So if you dig into the CDC website, buried in it are some diagrams, actually almost cartoons, that are showing uh, that six foot is measured between people, um, but they don't actually tell you how to do it. So our team ultimately decided that um, to do a six foot circle that is pretty much a donut. And what we have is a small inner circle that represents sort of a person's range of, of movement. And then we offset six feet, six feet from that. And the point of this anecdote is that you really have to be careful what you're basing your assumptions on and ideally go to the source. Um, another problematic issue that we're, we're seeing is, is the use of uh, plexiglass dividers everywhere. Um, research has shown that these are essentially large sneeze guards. Um, and they don't really protect the occupants from the aerosols, um, which is really the primary form of transmission as far as we understand. 
but what they do provide is a, is a peace of mind and something uh, that something is being done. So we have to be really careful of that. But uh, because, you know, people think that those guards are like the silver bullet or, or the simple solution. And the key point is that there's no silver bullet and there's no simple solution. So instead, what we found is that one has to really utilize a multiple range of strategies at the same time in an integrated manner and primarily to encourage flexibility. So um, a lot of the strategies that are being used, and, and there's a range of them, and I'm sure uh, people here will talk about them, is operational and procedural, such as staggering your workforce, um, encouraging distributed working, cleaning. Other strategies are engineering-based, fresh air, filtration, humidity, decreasing recirculation. Others are behavioral, such as wearing your mask when you're not at your desk, maintaining proper distancing and communicating. And some of these strategies are architectural. Um, such as properly distancing the workstations and the occupants. For us, we're using the six foot donut um, and creating sort of more open and democratic spaces that provide flexibility with different ways and places to work within the office in a distributed manner. So this idea of flexibility is really one of the key points that has emerged um, from my team as we've been working on this office webinar and one that we believe is critical to the future of a post COVID world and workplace. So in our webinar, we have two case studies where we propose some ideas of what this could be. Um, we are envisioning a flexible, open and more democratic office that offers uh, more equal access to light, to windows and to space and with different ways and places to work within the same space. Um, we think the days of offering one way to work is over of everyone having to show up to the office and work in, in sort of rows of uniform desks and workstation, we think that's over. Instead, we think that employers will be um, offering a variety of ways to work within the office that will include um, a reduced number of traditional workstations because not everyone will be in the office and that there will be an increased variety of informal spaces that can have a, a variety of uses, including workspaces. Now, some of these ideas that, are, that we're drawing out in our case studies include things like installing a knee wall um, or a low cabinet uh, that will act as a spine and contain data and power for desks to push up against. Um, you know, because of the inherent flexibility of this concept, those desks can be spaced closer or further apart, depending on the needs of the business, the occupancy requirements. And in a COVID-like uh, crisis, desks can be spaced further apart as need without disrupting any infrastructure. Another idea is simply to just have a long row of tables along a wall where you can seat employees closer or further apart as needed. This, this is actually how my office happens to be set up. And uh, when we had to sort of adapt to the pandemic, it took us about five minutes to just slide the computers a few feet apart. Um, but for companies that are actually looking to renovate or build um, in our webinar case studies, we're sketching out a few ideas uh, such as having a core that sort of contains um, meeting rooms, uh, phone booths, other enclosed spaces. And then around that, you've got the flexible desks arranged kind of in that, those manners that I just um, described, essentially like an inverse donut. Um, uh, another, um, it, it, well, anyway, so all of these schemes basically are using technology to make uh, distributed working easy and that there is essentially no difference in the hierarchy if you're working at home or in the office. So in conclusion, I think one of the main challenges that businesses are experiencing in any crisis is how to adapt and to pivot in order to survive. And during um, this pandemic, you know, the main difficulty for offices and a lot of small businesses is how to be properly socially, socially distanced in a small space without having to renovate and implement costly physical changes. And because this is so challenging, especially in large cities like New York, a lot of businesses are not doing that. Um, so, uh, you know, it should be noted that early on, a lot, you know, we all thought, a lot of the industry thought that there was gonna be a lot of renovations, but that just hasn't happened. And a lot of that is because uh, we don't have all the information, the science is changing, and, and we don't understand, you know, we don't know where things will end up. So I think over time, companies will, will move to renovate, but it won't be just because of this, it'll be because of other reasons. And when they do that, then I believe they will begin to implement the lessons learned from this pandemic.
Thank you uh, so much, Andre. I, um, I totally get it on the sneeze guards. My poor kids have to uh, carry their own around their school building and I'm not sure the efficacy of any of that. Um, but you do make a great point about the importance of the feeling of safety and what are the things that we can do to, to accomplish that sensibility. Um, I also love your points about furniture where the, the first generation of, of corporate furniture used this panel system as the infrastructure. Um, and in the future, the infrastructure might be more of a low slung, uh, like you're saying, this, this knee wall um, that connects uh, furniture to one another or that our, our office environments might be more like our home where you can push a piece of furniture into the position that it needs to be in and you get flexibility, flexibility that way. Um, speaking of home, um, that would bring us perfectly to Dennis. Um, you've really been looking into how our homes are changing um, inside and outside of American cities. Would love to hear uh, what you're seeing in trends there um, and maybe some of the psychology behind it. Thank you, yes. Uh, there's so much to talk about in a few minutes, so uh, I apologize that I might be reading um, most of what I have to say, but that, that's the only way to be sure that I get it done in a few minutes. Um, so I, I would like to summarize uh, two shifts uh, in residential design that I would say were in the works before COVID, but then dramatically pushed forward uh, because of COVID. Uh, the first relates to programming, and the second relates to site issues. And I will tell you uh, three short stories uh, that correspond to those shifts. Uh, the first was programming. Uh, up until recently, a home was a single-use building typology uh, used privately by its occupants for residential activities. Now, a home is a mixed-use building uh, typology, which is universally used um, privately by its occupants uh, for residential activities, but equally semi-publicly and publicly uh, for non-residential activities. So that's a dramatic uh, shift in a building typology. Um, just uh, to give you a sense, there are about 20% of buildings are single family homes. So to give you a sense of the shift of the building typology in the landscape, that's, that's significant. One, one story to go with that, uh, that is one of my favorites, is a high school teacher outside of Minneapolis who converted her basement into a science lab uh, for students in her uh, neighborhood, public school students in her neighborhood. So, um, you know, a building becoming an ex a home, becoming an extension of a, of a public school campus is a dramatic shift. And, and that kind of shift impacts uh, building codes, zoning codes, um, and municipal infrastructure and municipal resources. Uh, it is always anticipated that homes will have short-term uh, non-residential uses, but it's generally expected to be for a very limited time or under a very restricted work uh, at home uh, condition. Um, uh, so, and it is illegal in many places to run a business from a home. And, uh, and if it is a business, it would require a special permit. And I can tell you that in few places did a science lab ever receive a special permit um, for the basement of a home. Um, so residential communities are just simply not designed, not equipped, or intended to accommodate uh, this shift. Um, and I honestly believe it hasn't dawned on people yet that uh, these ex-urban residential communities that they are now living in um, are, in fact, they're now living in the middle of an office park or in the middle of a public school campus. I just think people are not aware of that yet. Um, the second piece is site. And that is kind of, you can see how the two kind of relate. And, and this analysis uh, might seem a bit metaphysical, but, uh, but please bear with me. Uh, the question is, where am I? You know, a am I at home? Am I at work? Or am I at a public conference? Am I joining this meeting from my home, from my office, or from the Center for Architecture? Um, so, uh, you know, it teaches us that, uh, that what we used to consider design, uh, focusing on two site conditions, uh, two perception of place has to change. Uh, we are still doing an analysis of the natural environment, including natural forces such as um, climate, sun, uh, stormwater mitigation. Uh, we still are doing an analysis for the built environment, still understanding the 
constructive context, the agency for building and the fabric of the infrastructure. But now we have to clearly understand residential design as it relates to the virtual environment. Uh, and here's a corresponding story for that. Uh, a young couple moved from downtown San Francisco to a thinly populated area of Houston. So um, for the greater part of their every day though, they are in the same place, the same office that they were in and the same university that they, that they used to participate in, working with the same people and socializing with the same community of people uh, before they moved. In fact, they still consider themselves Californians, not Texans. So what are the design implications uh, from that? What are the physical uh, ramifications from that? Which leads me um, to my third story, and it's entirely related. Um, here in the Hudson Valley, nearly every little village is now being called uh, the New Williamsburg. And, and that's because so many young families are moving out of the boroughs of New York City uh, into these small villages uh, to live and uh, work remotely here uh, in the Hudson Valley. However, they have not left their New York City community. And there is a corresponding residential design trend when these New Yorkers buy a home here, they paint the entire home one color, black. Uh, if, if a house is painted black or um, charcoal gray or black coffee, you can be certain that the occupants are New Yorkers living and working remotely from New York <laughs> City. So what is that? Well, painting homes black is an effort to defy assimilation. Uh, which reminds me of the Shaker and Quaker homes uh, that shown in the, as asymmetry and embellishment uh, to signify that they were not assimilating into the asymmetrical and embellished uh, societies that surrounded them. It also reminds me of residential communities of the U.S. armed services uh, that have built overseas in Italy and Japan, where the home designs look just like they would in Kansas. Um, so in conclusion, um, they say that architects are the canary in the coal mine, sensitive to seismic, uh, seismic changes before others. And I say residential architecture is the most uh, sensitive field of our industry. And if this is true, it has not yet dawned uh, on those consulting on the creation of comprehensive plans, those who sit on planning boards, or architect review boards, um, that the purpose and efficacy of contextualism, regionalism, or maybe even zoning is evaporated. Um, and for those that set healthy health and safety standards, the residential and residential uh, uh, architecture and residential communities, they will never go back um, to what they were um, before uh, COVID, uh, and especially not for post COVID uh, generations. So I think it's really fascinating time, and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, the impact on working with this event. Thank you so much, Dennis. Really appreciate that. We might uh, see people hiring architects to uh, fit out their Zoom backgrounds in the not too distant future. Um, I see just from this panel, we've got a couple people in office environments. We've got a couple people in residential environments. Uh, we might see the impact of ceilings being more significant and low slung lighting to make our faces look nice. Um, things are really starting to change just from that perspective. But thank you so much for sharing those. Um, Caitlin, I think we have another uh, set of audience questions. Um, these are a couple questions about what is changing in people's homes. Um, and I thought it might be interesting to pop in here uh, following Dennis's comments. Uh, first question, when working from home, what type of work setting do you use most often? Um, so are you using a dedicated uh, workroom, uh, a dedicated work area that's not a separate room? Um, are you using just other parts of your home um, or uh, other, uh, none of the above? Uh, if you could uh, chat your answer to us in the chat box, if we've got that up and running. That's question number one. Then question number two, what modifications have you made to your home environment um, to better accommodate your work? And you should uh, be able to uh, put multiple answers here. Um, so have you bought a chair, a standing desk? Uh, have you carved out a separate workspace, uh, task lighting? Uh, would just love to hear some of the things that uh, you're doing and, and check all that apply uh, for that one. Again, uh, panelists can't vote, um, but hopefully 
Caitlin, you can give people a couple of minutes for this. Um, and then um, momentarily we'll be going to uh, Nathan McRae um, and he'll be telling us a little bit the other side of the coin, the corporate uh, experience and sharing some of the things that have been changing uh, real time on that corporate uh, project that he talked to us about. So I presume you'll, we'll, all, we'll all be anticipating these home office changes. Caitlin. Oh, also, um, I am seeing some questions in the chat. Um, and I want to say to my panelists, if you see a chat question um, that is kind of your area of expertise, we might not answer it to the whole group um, on the audio channel. But if you could chat and then respond to the whole audience, uh, that would be great. Um, so 60% of our audience is working in a dedicated work area, but has not a separate room. 25% have a separate room. Um, and no one was up for chatting other. Um, maybe it's a little bit early in the morning and we need some more coffee. Uh, then uh, on question number two, what modifications uh, have you made? Uh, mostly people move furniture around to create dedicated workspace. So Andre, that's, uh, that's part of your corporate solution going forward. Um, acquired an external monitor, next highest ranking, um, bought an ergonomic chair, uh, I even saw an ergonomic chair uh, um, uh, advertised during prime time on television the other day. That was a bit of a surprise. Um, and uh, headphones and lighting, uh, maybe a little bit uh, towards the bottom of the list there. But thank you very much uh, for those comments. All right. Um, any actually quickly, Dennis? Any surprises there in uh, in the data that we just took a look at? No, not not at all. Not from what I'm hearing. Yeah. Excellent. Alrighty, uh, Nathan, let, let us know uh, what's happening short and long term in uh, corporate uh, world. Sure, um, I, can, I can talk a little bit about the strategies that we've come up with um, as a result of the, the exercise I mentioned previously. Um, we, we kind of wanted to tackle first what kinds of infrastructural impacts uh, would be likely on the project or, or would be appropriate. Um, to, to kind of mirror Dennis's comment about programming, um, the, the programming actually did change. So uh, the, this workplace that had a certain ratio of collaborative space to individual workspace, we ended up shifting it uh, towards what we called a great, more of a resource model. So uh, because people aren't having to sit at their desk nine to five, uh, there's greater acceptance of people working from home. You, we imagine that people will really be coming to that place for a meeting, for collaborating, for uh, interacting and, and having some kind of exchange. So we upped the number of, of those types of facilities uh, within the building. So more meeting rooms, more large uh, presentation spaces, more informal collaboration. Um, and the desk model turns into more of a, a hoteling model so, and, and fewer of them. So that, that's a, a substantial change to the project. Um, that that we're implementing now. Um, in terms of other spatial um, infrastructural considerations, surprisingly, it, it doesn't change that much. The, the building is designed, and most buildings, as, as Andre mentioned, that, that, that we're not having to, we're not seeing dr drastic um, renovations. Um, I would say the exception being mechanical systems. Um, but there wasn't much to change. I was concerned that Elevators, we might need larger elevators to have social distancing and avoid huge queuing out the door. Um, but when you're at an increased or decreased capacity, at least in a low rise building, I think this may be different for high rises, but um, this is a relatively low rise project. And uh, it, it turns out that we could socially distance four people within an elevator. And the next step up to a six person elevator is huge. So that wasn't, wasn't gonna be reasonable and isn't enough of an increase to make it, to make it useful. Um, so, uh, we did pedestrian flow studies and it looked like a building as designed pretty much could, could work, um, relatively well with, with low, a low number of, of real infrastructural changes. Um, the kinds of, of strategies that we, we are recommending are relate to interior air quality. Um, so increasing outdoor air. Uh, a DOAS system, for example, that um, has dedicated outdoor air where you can target fresh air to a room based on occupancy, um, which can reduce energy consumption, uh, as well as, as creating ventilation, which is, is critical, increasing ventilation and filtration. So uh, 
they're recommending going up to a MERV 16 capable filtration system, um, which is getting a bit technical. But um, the interesting thing to me was that uh, you don't actually always want to be using this high level filtration because it increases uh, energy consumption. So there's offsetting yeah. uh, sustainability metrics that come along with the increased wellness by of, uh, of some of these strategies. So you want to make it MERV 16 capable, but you might just want to use a MERV 12 or MERV 13 filter generally when you're not in a pandemic situation. Um, an infrastructural consideration, one of, one of them was uh, relative to, to bathrooms, toilet rooms. Um, so uh, they were, were implementing individual stalls, which allow them to have their own supply and, and return air um, to decrease transmission in, in that setting. Um, it also, a, a, a positive outcome of that is that it lends you to a gender inclusive type of arrangement. So that's, a, a, I think, a positive outcome of, of these considerations. Um, what else? We talked about uh, material selection. Uh, in general, we found that antimicrobials uh, products are, are generally not high efficacy and are, we're not recommending them. Uh, we are recommending where possible to use copper, which um, is antimicrobial naturally, easy to clean, low maintenance. Um, so, and then in general, uh, operations, operationally, uh, uh, increased cleaning regimen is important. So then you have to uh, specify durable materials that can stand up to that cleaning because uh, we're seeing things disintegrate as they're being cleaned constantly. Um, pedestrian flow and, and social distancing, the, all, the, all the kind of typical stuff that we, that we all understand um, are, need to be able to be implemented um, when, when, in, when in a crisis kind of situation. Um, so we took all these strategies and, and mapped them on, uh, or in the process of mapping them in kind of a heat map from uh, impact on one axis and effectiveness on the other. So that when you start to get the ones clustering in the upper right where they're highly effective and low cost or, or easy to implement, um, those, those are the ones that we're tending to recommend. Um, so that's kind of the process and some of the considerations that we that we went through. Um, uh, I, I'm looking at the at that heat map, and um, some of the easy to implement and high effective strategies were um, pedestrian flow strategies, uh, operational, um, automated contract tracing, which is is relatively easy mm -hmm. to implement, uh, removal of access through contact tracing, um, enhanced air filtration, DOAS systems, uh, social distancing, cleaning regimen, facial recognition for contact tracing. Uh, and then air filtration, UV filters are, are relatively easy to implement. Um, so I, some of it's pretty straightforward stuff, but it was interesting to, to evaluate them in terms of those kinds of criteria. Thank you, Nathan. Really appreciate that. Um, proof that design uh, is sort of at its best under the, uh, the critical lens, right? When we're, when we're up against a bunch of constraints, it really pushes us to design solutions that we might not have come up with uh, otherwise, and, and also to have those, those pros and cons um, laid out. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think, Katie, you'll... Um, you'll offer us some further insight on some of these things that are changing, um, particularly from a wellness, uh, maybe, the, maybe the pros and cons, uh, as, uh, as Nathan mentioned, um, where we see sometimes to get to a wellness um, benefit, uh, it's a sustainability cost uh, or vice versa. Um, so, uh, and just another reminder uh, to our panelists, is if you're able to answer some of the questions we see coming in by chat, um, that would be great. Uh, Katie? Great, thanks, Melissa. So yes, I am working on ESG sustainability programs over the last couple of years, and then really having wellness come in and having some of those um, factors contradict one another, but forced us to become more creative in those solutions and understanding that we need to be flexible, that um, I forget who mentioned it earlier, but that we're not always going to be in a pandemic state. So being able to adjust and have our mechanical systems um, be able to adapt accordingly to prioritize energy efficiency when possible, um, depending on capacity of the space, number of people there, as well as uh, 
if we're actually in the office or not, um, looking at demand response options, ways to really harness energy efficiency in some days, and then prioritize health and wellness when we're really in those spaces, utilizing them to their capacity. Um, and so working on these new rating systems, well health and safety and fit well, I shared links to those just if you want to take a deeper dive and look at um, some of the features that they recommend. Um, a lot of them are operationally focused. Um, they're really looking at a short term timeline, limited budget, what can be done now so that we can get um, these spaces reoccupied as safely as possible. Um, and they're different from the larger certifications, from their like parent certifications um, in kind of their intent. Um, they're not exactly requiring change. They're looking at, they're hoping that owners are going to go through the thought process of looking at, so what does hand washing look like? Are we including ad adequate sinks in all bathrooms, break rooms, food prep, wellness areas? Um, and in that actual sink design, are we ensuring that between the water column and the back of the sink basin, there's adequate room for your hands that you're not hitting the back of it um, and not picking up excess germs that you think you're getting rid of. Um, and then looking at the hand drying methods, if we're using paper towels, great, let's make sure um, there's adequate number that we're not leaving them all over the place. And then if we're looking at um, hand dryers, making sure they're equipped with the HEPA filters and making that adjustment if it's not um, already in place and then having that hand washing signage that I'm sure um, architects have seen being rolled out requesting those signage packages across the board. Um, some of the other areas that we've been looking at that definitely align with um, what Nathan had mentioned, mentioned are reducing surface contact, taking an inventory of what are those high touch surfaces um, that we are including in common areas, doorknobs, handles, telephones, elevator buttons, um, faucets. How can we reduce the need for contact, that kind of touchless entry, um, automatic soap dispensers, ticket list entry, any like voice activated elevators. Um, what are some of those strategies and how can we intentionally design those common areas to reduce the need for contact, um, either person to person or with those um, stationary doorknobs, et cetera. Um, kind of the final item that Nathan touched on, which is really, I think, one of the key aspects and where we're seeing uh, the most conversation is about the ventilation systems. Um, understanding the highest supply rate of outdoor air um, and being able to provide that to occupants, but then balancing that um, with the energy efficiency aspect um, and sometimes looking at demand controlled ventilation, changing those set points depending on what the priorities are for that time. Um, we have been recommending MERV 13 filters um, across the board and one of the challenges is that some of the older systems can't, can't fit those, can't accommodate those. Um, I'm sure some of the engineers on here have run into that issue and tried to um, come up with some alternatives for that. I have not yet seen MERV 16, but that is very exciting. And if there's um, anywhere down the line where that becomes standard, I'd be all for it. Um, but we've seen MERV 13 at this at this point in time. Um, and the filters for other areas. And then it, this UVGI um, equipment installing that or understanding if that's something that can't be done short term because it does take a little bit more work, especially if you're retrofitting um, an older system or one that's just not prepared for that. Um, when we're designing systems now, maybe we think about that in terms of um, an add on for the future um, and really understanding how air and water, water monitoring and testing um, can help provide us useful information once we've already been in that space. So trying to integrate sensors where appropriate um, one of my clients that has achieved well version two certification, um, we used an air testing uh, monitoring system called Senseware. And so one of the features that we pursued for well, which I thought was really interesting, was operable windows. And so being in New York City, I believe they were on the 13th floor. It was a question of it, what are we doing? No one has operable windows here. Why, why are we considering this? And mm -hmm. so for us, we weren't able to increase that supply rate um, from the base building. System wasn't set up that way. We weren't reducting. That, that wasn't an option, but operable windows were an option. And one of the things that we installed was um, an outdoor air sensor to tell us, okay, what is the outdoor air quality? What's the temperature? What's the humidity? Um, then there's a sensor that's set up that tells us if it's within the set range 
of what we have determined as um, safe for occupants to open the windows. And mm -hmm. then they're within range, we receive a notification and the windows will, can then be opened by occupants if they so choose to increase that outdoor air rate. Um, it's been exciting and I'm excited to see what happens in the future in the next um, year or two as we really see people start to um, re-enter, use these spaces to see what sticks around um, yep. and what further technological advancements there are. Excellent. Thank you so much, Katie. And on that point that uh, both you and Nathan just mentioned, um, all of this is going uh, towards making us feel safer in these environments. Um, I'd like to ask for our last audience poll. Um, and we've got two questions. One is, in your opinion, what is the most critical building environment topic to focus on? Signage and communications, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, cleaning and maintenance, health screening, PPE, space planning. Uh, we don't have the other here, but if you do have others that you'd like to add, uh, go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, but we're asking you to rank here, so to tell us number one. Um, and then number two, what environments are you currently comfortable in? Uh, so this is multiple check boxes. We presume you're all comfortable at home, but maybe you're getting a little uncomfortable there, not for health reasons or maybe for mental health reasons. Um, outdoors, local establishments, national chain stores and restaurants. Um, I think you see these are getting progressively public. Um, corporate office complex or shopping mall and any, anywhere indoors or out, um, you feel that we've kind of solved for uh, COVID risks in physical environments. So um, looking forward to your perspectives there. And then we're gonna have a final lightning round for our panelists. And we're gonna ask them a bit about what they see in the future good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, Nathan and I enjoyed a couple conversations uh, before this talking about let's not get hung up on what's right now. Let's keep our eyes focused on the future. So that's going to be our last question. Um, and we do see some questions coming in in the chat. We're going to try to address that in the, uh, in the final few minutes here. All right. Heating, air conditioning, and filtration. Yay, ASHRAE. <laughs> Um, I think that may be somewhat influenced by our audience. Health screening, no one cares. Um, I do have to say that with kids in school, I wish that were more of a focus, uh, but we'll leave that one there. Um, what environments are you currently comfortable in? Um, at home, only 89%. So I'm a little concerned about that 11% that's not comfortable at home. Um, outdoors, 86. Local establishments are doing well, 33. National chain 11, corporate office 17. Glad to see that corporate office is uh, faring better than national chains. And congratulations to the 14% of you that feel comfortable anywhere slash everywhere. Um, thank you for those. And it uh, does seem like, um, if, if I could take anything from that data, I would say that that it feels like as a building industry, we're solving for this. I'm, I'm, um, I feel positive and, and optimistic about uh, some of those numbers in relation to people's level of comfort uh, that maybe has been accomplished there. Um, so we're gonna do this lightning round. I have two questions um, that if you could incorporate, if you feel appropriate to incorporate in your closing, we have a question on the future of labor um, and how this telework might impact um, a per particularly administrative and other office services functions. Um, as well as building trust um, and how we're doing that as designers. So if you feel an opportunity to incorporate that in your closing remarks, please do. And um, I'm going to go to uh, Andre and hope that you could tell us a little bit about what you see in your crystal ball, sir. Um, I mean, I think I, I addressed some of that in my initial remarks, which is essentially uh, designing, I mean, not only offices, but I think a lot of different typology, uh, typologies with flexibility and the ability to adapt and to pivot uh, in different situations. Um, uh, and I think in terms of, 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 of trust and, and getting employees to come back, I think uh, communication and being open about what we know and what we don't know, what we control and what we don't control is absolutely critical. It's really important to not uh, to not pretend that we have all the answers or that an employer ha it has made uh, an environment uh, safe because we don't we don't have enough information to be able to make those determinations and 
what we can do is we can show that we are doing everything that we can based on what we know. And I think it's important to outline, outline those things, but there are pros and cons to all of these. And I, I think one of the key points here is that it, it, it takes a variety of different solutions or not solutions, a variety of different techniques layered on top of each other to, ad to address this. But I think that ultimately um, long-term, I, I think that the opportunity to design more uh, open and kind of democratic spaces that, that really uh, make our workplaces um, a better place is, is really the opportunity. And, and I think that because of that, you know, our, our industry and profession is really at an inflection point where we can really show sort of what uh, our profession and what design and engineering can really do to solve the most challenging problems that we have today. All right, thank you, Andre. And this is moving towards a lightning round so we can give a few minutes to Ashray for uh, their conversation as well. Um, Dennis, what does the future look like from your perspective? Well, I, I think in residential design, it is all about migration. I think that everybody can see um, by what's happening in the real estate market, people from Manhattan moving to Brooklyn, people from Brooklyn moving out of Brooklyn. People. And I feel like right now we're kind of like have the snow globe kind of condition where somebody <laughs> shook us and we don't know um, where we're going to land. Uh, but on the same time, uh, I think as reflected in our politics, people are clinging more tightly to community and the idea that community doesn't have to be about a place, but about like-mindedness. I think there's some interesting things that are happening there with regard to um, urbanites who feel um, happy living in urban communities, uh, identify as conservationists, environmentalists, um, culturalists, and yet uh, refuse to be identified with ex-urban uh, kind of ideas of inelastic social um, order. So I think that, that those things generally end up um, uh, having an impact on what people, how people define home and, uh, and community. And I think that, that I think it's a brave new world uh, that we're about to enter. Excellent. Thank you for that optimistic uh, ending. And it is an exciting time on this community level. Uh, I love that point and how our design is expressing that community. Uh, Nathan, what does uh, your crystal ball or your snow globe uh, look like? Coming off mute. Sorry about that. I was uh, lost in the Q&A session. What was the question about? <laughs> I'm answering questions no, about I Thank you so much for answering those questions. I love that you're geeking out on that because there's some pretty uh, technical stuff there. Um, I'm hoping that you could tell us a little bit about what you see in the future um, quickly. Well, hopefully, um, as I mentioned before, not, not COVID area buildings. Um, nobody wants to look at, back at a building and say that must have been designed in 2020 because it has uh, a door, an in and out doorway um, and giant <laughs> corridors that, that are devoid of people. So um, we actually designed this project that I've been referencing with the intent of having people collaborate and have knowledge collisions and, and intersect with one another, which turns out to be a perfect COVID breeding ground. Um, but <laughs> I'm hoping it can get back to, back to there um, and, and that we're not uh, stuck in this, in this space for too long. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Nathan, and maybe pairing that with Dennis's comments about uh, where we are in geography as well, so we can have the best uh, of urban and uh, exurban worlds. All right. And last to you, Katie, um, what does uh, what does the future look like from your perspective or what are you hoping to see happen? Mm -hmm. I'm really excited for the increased use of indoor environmental quality sensing monitoring, purification, filtration system, that combined technology to be able to provide occupants with um, real-time data of what is happening in their space um, to increase their confidence in uh, the health and wellness, understanding the air quality and what's kind of happening there. Um, and that combined, I think, with kind of what Nathan spoke to of more of an activity-based workplace um, design strategy and kind of transitioning more from everyone having a standard desk to understanding what is actually being done in the office if we are spending a couple of days at home. What are those spaces that we need? Um, how are we going to best foster productivity and comfort simultaneously without sacrificing our um, energy efficiency? 
I really appreciate that, Katie. I've been speaking um, on and off about this topic and saying that COVID is really an accelerant. Um, I think it's pushing forward some of those trends that have not been able to kind of get off the starting block, so to speak, particularly building technology and smart smart sensor based buildings. Um, hopefully we can have future buildings that are more like our, our foot Fitbit or our smart wellness app uh, that really connect people to the building and have a, a dynamic feedback uh, mechanism. Um, and maybe there's a way that that connects also Dennis, our home uh, environments and our work environments in new and interesting ways. Um, time flies when you're having fun. My goodness, an hour is gone. Thank you so much to our amazing panelists, um, to our audience. I know that we've only scratched the surface here. Um, all of our panelists are really thoughtful contributors to the industry, and I'm sure they would be happy to answer your questions offline. If you didn't get enough of any of us, uh, please do uh, feel free to reach out um, and keep connected through the AIA New York um, and the uh, Urban Green Council. Give a, I'm going to hand it back um, to our hosts um, to uh, wrap up the conversation. Great. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you to our panelists today. Um, we have someone from Ashley joining us in just a second here um, as a panelist. Oh, there he is. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sarvesh, and I am the Research Promotion Chair for the ASHRAE New York Chapter. I would like to take a few more minutes uh, to recognize our 2019-2020 ASHRAE New York donors. Uh, this past year has been difficult with the ongoing pandemic. Um, however, thanks to our dedicated support from our donors, we were able to exceed our uh, chapter donation goals by 4%. Um, while we were unable to host our traditional donor recognition dinner meeting, we could not let your contributions go unrecognized. So, um, um, and so we wanted to uh, make sure that we get, got a chance to recognize um, our donors at um, an ASHRAE event. Contributions from our donors um, are a vital part of New York chapter uh, and making it successful and your support makes us uh, makes a strong statement about your commitment to ASHRAE's mission of a critical um, to, of, may, of creating a healthy and sustainable environment. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize our donors. Um, Caitlin, are you able to bring up the PowerPoint presentation, please? Yes. Can you see that? Yes. All right, I'd like to start uh, with our tier one gold donors. Yeah. Uh, Carrier Enterprises, Con Edison, CDE Air Conditioning. Next slide, please. WSP, SRS Enterprises, ADE Systems, AKF Group, Pelimo, GA Fleet, Goldman Copeland Consulting Engineers, The Fulcrum Group, Johnson Controls, JBNB, Tech Systems, Train, Cisco Hennessy Group, Technical Air Systems, Daikin, Chimney Design Solutions, ADS Engineers, Cerami, Schneider Electric, National Air Filter, EcoCare Corp, Siemens, Federal Pump, Thermal Systems Associates, Vitalik, Wallace Ennis, and Skyline Engineering. I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome our new donors, Wales Darby and Rath Associates. Thank you everyone for your continued support to our chapter. Um, I have one last announcement. Uh, our next uh, ASHRAE chapter dinner meeting will be in January, which we will send out an email blast um, early next year. 
So thank you once again um, and have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Great, thank you. And thank you to everybody who spoke today. Have a great day.